Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to talk about signal to noise ratio and about some of the theoreticals that come with astrophotography. And I'll try to keep it as simple possi as possible because I've done videos that dive really in depth into those topics, but I want to try to simplify it into a shorter video just so that everyone can have the awareness of what it is that we are doing when we are taking so much exposure time on targets, stacking exposures, and basically trying to increase our signal to noise ratio. Now, why am I making this video now? It is because one of my viewers, Laurent Devineau, has sent across an amazing document that goes into all of the details, including actual measurements of data they have captured under their home skies that measure uh, the effect of things like read noise or offsets, dark current, all this kind of stuff. And I'll put the link in the description down below. It is an amazing document. It also casually explains stuff using quantum mechanics, but in an understanding manner, uh, understandable manner. And it's also as an appendix, so don't worry. It's actually uh, fairly simple if you have a bit of engineering background. I absolutely love this and I highly, highly recommend giving it a read. At any rate, let's start with um, the, the whole thing about signal, light pollution, and like what is the target signal, what is the, uh, tar the light pollution signal, and the associated noise. So basically the gist of it is when we're taking an exposure of an object, let's say M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, we're trying to get an idea of what is the signal of the target onto each our, of our sensor pixels using our telescope to basically capture as much light as possible and put it into those pixels. So what happens actually with that uh, Galaxy M31 is if I were to go in outer space and have absolutely zero light pollution whatsoever, I could take a picture with an ideal sensor. The sensor does not have any noise whatsoever. So the, the sensor is perfect. There is no aberrations, no, no problem with the optics. Everything is pitch perfect, including the target. And then I, hit, I take two one second exposures of that target, M31, from outer space with a perfect sensor, perfect optics. And uh, I compare one exposure to the next. Do you think we'll get the same result? The answer is no, no, we will not get the same result. And this is because uh, the light itself has associated noise. Effectively, effectively, this is because photons, they don't arrive in a very nice regular stream of, of photons down to your pixel. It's not just like, okay, on average, we have uh, eight photons per second reaching that particular, uh, that par particular pixel. So exactly, uh, one eighth, each one eighth of a second is one photon that arrives on the, our sensor. That is not the case. Uh, the case is more that, okay, you could have like one photon arriving uh, during the first second, and then the next second we have 17 photons arriving, and then the next one we have eight, and then, the, and you see, it's like meaning like if I took my one second exposure for when there was only one photon that arrived on my, on my pixel, then my pixel will hardly register anything. Whereas if I took uh, the one second exposure where 17 uh, photons reached that pixel, then that pixel has a brighter uh, result, right? And so this is what is called the shot noise. And what is magical about that shot noise is that it's very easy to model in terms of its value. And the result, which I find absolutely mind boggling and, and awesome, but that's just me, is that the uh, signal, like the signal amplitude basically that you get, okay, if this, you have your signal, the value of your signal in, in for example, the, uh, the pix pixel brightness value, for instance, uh, the shot noise associated with that is, is the square root of your signal, which is, I, I find that amazing. And this is because we can model those photons reaching our sensor as what we call a Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution is also used for th some things like um, people coming to shops. You could have a shop that gets eight people per hour that go into the shop, but maybe uh, one hour it will be zero people and the next one it will be 16, right? On average, it's eight. But 
uh, over time, it's like you have like this, this poisson distribution of people reaching your, your shop. It's like a temporal distribution. The same type of stuff is used in things like networking and networking protocols with the packets. Um, so it's like very widely used. And so those distributions are very commonly used and, and they're very well understood. And so what happens is that the uh, standard deviation of, uh, of a Poisson distribution that has an average value, let's say the average value is eight, or we'll make it simple, simpler. The average value of my distribution is nine. So we get nine customers or nine photons per unit of time to my shop or to my sensor pixel. Uh, it means that the actual standard deviation which means kind of like the variability that you can get b between each unit of time is three. It's square root of nine. And that's, that's an awesome result. Okay, so we know that um, the, the galaxy, it will have a certain amount of signal per pixel. And we are basically looking for that average value. The average value is going to be what we want. And the shot noise, the square root of that average value is our enemy, it's the variability. And so by taking a lot of exposures or a single exposure across a, a, a long amount of time, we can average out the variability that we have between units of times to really reach closer and closer to the ideal average. That's what we're doing. Okay, so now what about light pollution or sky glow or sky, sky flux or whatever? Uh, the light pollution is where things get really annoying because the light pollution for all intents and purposes, the, it behaves exactly the same as the target. So the light pollution is a signal. You have the signal of light pollution. It's extremely in intense. Its uh, mean value, its average is much higher typically than the target that you are trying to image, at least from here in Tokyo, from the city. And it behaves with the same Poisson distribution, which means that the square root of the mean value of your light pollution is the noise. And so when you go in PixInsight or in Star Tools or in APP or in Photoshop with Gradient Exterminator or whatever, and you take your image and you remove the background, what you're doing is you're basically removing the average light pollution that you captured, which is great. What this doesn't do is remove the shot noise that was introduced by light pollution. And that's why light pollution is such an issue. You can uh, limit its impact by uh, basically trying to image only when the target is high in the sky or by doing narrowband imaging, that kind of stuff, so that the, you want to reduce the signal of the light pollution. And by reducing the signal, the average strength of the light pollution, uh, you can also reduce the noise introduced by the light pollution at the same time because it is the square root. And so what happens is when you take long exposures or total long uh, integration time is what you're doing is the, uh, the average uh, signal that you're getting since you're getting it like every exposure, it's, your signal to noise ratio will increase for your target will increase linearly. And at the same time, the noise from your light pollution what is remaining after you remove the signal from the light pollution by doing a background extraction uh, will increase as a square root. Now the square root of the light pollution, at least in, in Tokyo, the, the, the value under the square root is so much higher than the target value that it takes a long time, a very long time for, for this to get better. And uh, those are not the only sources of noise. You have the dark current or the thermal noise from your sensor, which you can mitigate by having a cool astrophotography camera. And that helps a lot. But what, is, uh, what cannot be removed easily is the read noise of the sensor or the offset noise or the bias noise. This is what we try to uh, remove when we take bias frames. Well, we try to remove the average but there is the, uh, the noise associated with reading the sensor. What happens is that each of your pixels will get photons um, landing onto them. Each time a photon lands on your pixel, there will be a certain probability to the quantum efficiency that this photon is converted into an electron. And at the end of your exposure, you'll have the whole sensor pixel per pixel is read out to figure out how many electrons were stored in each pixel effectively. So you're reading that out and converting that digitally and that introduces noise. This is the read noise and the read noise uh, when you add it independently with the other sources of noise, like your light pollution shot noise or your target shot noise, 
it's basically you need to add their squares. Uh, mathematically, that's how it works. So you need to add their squares. And so each time you take an exposure, you have the square of the read noise that's added to the other sources of noise. And then you take the square root of all of that stuff. So that means that in theory, the fewer exposures, the better, right? Because then you introduce less read noise. And that's where you get the optimal exposure times or sub exposure times, how long each of your frames should be so that you swamp the read noise or you overwhelm the read noise. And the target of that is effectively to say that uh, basically, ideally, we want each exposure to be as long as possible. The problem is our sensors have a certain capability per pixel to store electrons. This is the full well depth. So each pixel can store up to a certain number of electrons. After that, the pixel is saturated and more electrons and more photons don't change anything. And so we cannot expose an image forever. Another reason is guiding. Uh, and tracking and wind and external conditions that prevent us from taking like if an infinitely long exposures or even you know the, the earth rotating as well <laughs> that's something as well so because of that we want always to find like what is the minimum exposure time that i can get away with where my read noise becomes insignificant and because your light pollution noise in cities like Tokyo is so high, it's fairly easy to swamp your read noise because then you can just look at your read noise. You can even look at the target shot noise and be like, huh, those are negligible compared to my light pollution noise. They're like nothing. I can ignore them. And so by choosing a long exposure time or an exposure time that is just long enough that you swamp your read noise to some criteria of your satisfaction, then uh, you're, you're good, good to go, right? And so this is highly dependent on the, uh, on the sky glow, on your light pollution. And so when you have a high amount of light pollution, you can get away with shorter exposures very easily. When you have less light pollution or when you're using a narrowband filter, then uh, you, it's not that you can get away with shorter exposures, it's that you can get away with longer exposures. You, it gives you the ability to take longer exposures so that you add less read noise with each of the sub exposures that you do of your image. So that's kind of like the fun stuff there. And so that's where this optimal exposure time comes about. There are tons of techniques to, uh, to measure it. I have a video on the topic. I'll put a, a link up above that's very, um, very simple, or at least I try to keep it so. And there are other methods, of course, to basically make the most of your imaging time. It's things like your aperture and your focal ratio and, and your quantum efficiency of the camera for specific uh, colors or band passes. And uh, most of our astrophotography cameras will do excellently in terms of quantum efficiency. Like the most popular sensor these days are is like the 571 uh, from Sony. There's also like the sensor in the, uh, I, uh, in the 533 uh, cameras. Um, they're basically the same sensor, just the different sizes. Uh, and those are, are amazing. And where it comes is the, the optics. And the optics, it's all about like if you have a large aperture, then you have a light bucket, right? So you're basically gathering the photons that are falling from the sky into your large aperture. The bigger the aperture, the bigger the surface area that's used to capture photons, the better and the surface area increases with the square of the radius. So you can really, you really get good returns on investment with higher apertures. So that's the total amount of, uh, of photons that you're gathering per unit of time. Cool. Uh, but at the same time, you're, you're zooming into your target. By zooming in onto your target, you're spreading across the light, the photons that you have gathered uh, across more surface area or more pixels effectively. So the more you zoom in, the fewer photons that you've, uh, that you've gotten will reach each individual pixel. Uh, you're zooming in more so you have more detail, more resolution, but at the same time, there's fewer photons that reach each, uh, each pixel uh, of, your, of your sensor. So that's, where, that's why we look at the focal length, which is the amount that you uh, zoom, f zoom by, and we look at the aperture together, and we take the ratio of those two, and that is the focal ratio, the lower the better. And so my own equipment, it's a hyperstar based uh, setup. It has a focal ratio of f2, which is excellent, although it is nowhere near as sharp and uh, as an equivalent like refractor telescope 
that, uh, that will have a, a focal ratio of maybe f4, f5, or f5, something like that. So that's where things are, are different, and that's what can help us gather as much signal to noise ratio as possible. We want to gather as much time, imaging time on each target so that we, we maximize our signal to noise ratio. Again, I'm trying to stay as simple as possible. Um, and it's probably inaccurate. So please let me know inaccuracies and mistakes that I make in the comments down below. Because to be honest, look, the focal ratio versus aperture thing is discussed ad nauseam online and it's horrible and it's because you have a lot of people that say the focal ratio is irrelevant only the aperture matters uh, but that's like a whole can of worms of like focal ratio versus resolution versus taking an image at higher resolution resizing it down to match the lower res resolution instead and saying like we had they're basically the same and oh, it's um, I, I might be wrong there's so much debate and you have like threads on cloudy nights with tons and tons of pages and differing opinions for now like that's the gist of my understanding at the moment anyway it's just like i wanted to put into a single video and i i'm sorry there's no charts if you want all of the charts calculation graphs on this kind of stuff you really want to go and check the link down below that work by my subscriber is amazing laurent did such an amazing work and laurent you should really make a video where you spend like a couple of couple of hours on your slides explaining them one by one that would be like the ultimate astrophotography lecture seriously do it <laughs> yeah so that's uh that's what i wanted to cover in the, into this video kind of like the basics there's another basic by the way that is a very well-known figure and it's ag again due to the nature of the noise that poisson distribution but that if you have a specific uh signal to noise ratio in a single sub-exposure, let's say you have a one minute sub-exposure uh, and you look at the signal to noise ratio and then you take on that target 100 sub-exposures and you assume that the earth is no longer rotating and you're always taking the, this at the zenith so atmosphere, light pollution is unchanged. Um, your, uh, your signal to noise ratio will have increased by a factor of 10 by the square root of 100 so 100 exposures will have a 10 times better signal to noise ratio so square root of 100 compared to a single one minute exposure but as you can tell there are diminishing returns very quickly so that's uh, that's where that square root kind of uh, uh, kind of rule comes from so anyway again sorry it's like kind of a talking head video but i felt like it's very it's a very interesting topic it's a topic that i like it's a topic that i still make mistakes about have misconceptions so if you find this interesting if you find that there are there's additional information i should be talking about if you find that i'm i've i have some misconceptions and i'm completely wrong please let me know down in the, in the comments and if you're interested in astrophotography and in this kind of video in general feel free to leave me a like uh, subscribe ring, put that bell icon etc etc but more important than that don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and i'll see you next time